Welcome to the reality show, day 175 of the war in Israel. Uh, so, you know, we were talking on the Daily Objective just now about the things Israel is accused of and uh, and the things it should actually do. We're going to go through an article here that is uh, special. Daniel will put it in the uh, in the live chat and in the description. You can read along uh, while you're watching or listening. But this is, uh, you know, we, we talked about how we're now hearing there's a famine in Gaza and, you know, we'll... We'll we'll talk about the details, but we're hearing yeah people are starving. We're of course we're hearing people are are being killed. We're hearing a lot of a lot of things that are not true, at least the way they're being presented. Certainly um, nowhere near as many people as we're hearing are being killed or actually being killed. Uh, the starvation issue is is as far as any evidence goes, one hundred percent made up, and yet it is what uh, what the world is uh, telling us. But again. There's a, there's a question there of fact. There's a question there of value. Value wise, it would not be a bad thing uh, if if the Palestinians were starved. We're going to get to that as well. Let's just jump into this uh, this article right away. So this is theconversation.com. dot uh, The article's title is "Gaza Conflict: Snapshot of a Population Being Starved into Submission." So they are already telling you with the headline. Where, where they stand, they think Israel is intentionally starving the population in Gaza. Of course, we know uh, what is the truth, and unfortunately, this is not it. Uh, so the article starts, uh, Israel has banned the UN aid coordinating agency UNRWA from accessing the population of northern Gaza, where a major famine is now believed to be imminent. The country has accused UNRWA staff of involvement in the October 7th Hamas attack, but has provided no evidence this was the case, uh, and the agency denies the allegation. So this is just the first paragraph. There are three links in uh, in this uh, one paragraph. One of them is to uh, the UN itself. Uh, one is to a news story in Reuters of uh, UNRWA denying the allegations. Uh, another is to a news story in CNN of UNRWA denying the allegations. Of course, there there is ample evidence. If uh, if you haven't watched the many shows that we've done in UNRWA, we encourage you to do that. Um, the evidence is out there. You can go to UN Watch as well. Uh, but yeah, this is how the article kind of uh, tells us uh, where they're headed or or everything we need to know about them in paragraph one. Jonathan. I wasn't surprised to see it. It kind of fits in with, you know, the the whole notion of you know Israel is a uh, even Joe Rogan this week accused, I believe, uh, Israel of committing genocide. But let me let me ask you: is the the premise is a little bit off in the sense uh, is is uh, are the Palestinians submitting? Are they being starved into submission? You know, this is a a, a couple of the headlines I saw. Uh, Razi and Morgan, that 70% of Palestinians, and this is a recent poll, support the October 7th terror attack. This is a, a National Review headline from just this week, but these are some polls from even late last year, early uh, 2024, that you know the Palestinians support, by and large, support the war that was waged against Israel. So, uh, you know, this this is war. And you know, I it's it's terrible, but it was started by the Palestinians. It was started by Hamas, and you know the whole notion that it's Israel's responsibility somehow to take. You know, when I have some other quotes from Dr. Peikoff and and uh, and Miss Rand, but you know the whole notion that well, Israel is supposed to take care of the Palestinians, feed them, clothe them. It is so backward from what, in my opinion, at least the actual purpose of a war is. And the reason we have war and the reason war is moral and how war should be fought. And certainly, as I understand, the objectivist presentation of, of how war should be fought and the ultimate losers are not only, in my opinion, the Israeli people who are much less safe, the Israeli soldiers, but Westerners, all Americans, because this just encourages Hamas or Islamic Jihad or the next militant Islamic group to pull the same shite in the U.S., in Israel, or anywhere around the world. Yeah, uh, and just a quick word on those polls. Yeah, poll after poll shows it's over 70% support. I think that number uh, is, is uh, I've made this point before, that number is 
can, can get people uh, confused into thinking that it's just over 70%. The, the poll doesn't show you why people who oppose it oppose it. And if you ask them, I guarantee you, it's not because they think it's wrong to slaughter Jews. It's just because it didn't work out the way they wanted to. Maybe the timing was wrong. Uh, you know, there is not 25% uh, of the Palestinian population who actually uh, want to live side by side in peace with Israel. So, yeah, the number the number of people who would like to see things like October 7th happen again and again, uh, without a doubt, the percentage is much, much higher than that. Morgan. Unfortunately, <clears throat> despite this famine narrative coming out. And I just point out to people that the reality of a famine or the impending nature of a famine shifts depending on who you're speaking to or which reporting you look at. Some people are, have been declaring in recent days that famine has already set in, and some people are saying that it's on the way. And famine either is there or it is not. Now, this article is alleging it's in different places at different levels, which is a bit more of a sophisticated claim. But I just point out to people that in judging whether people know what they're talking about, the famine's either there or it's not. It's like it can't be completely there and widespread or absent. So people just need to think about that. And then also looking at Elon Levy's Twitter today, he's been addressing this very much. Now, <clears throat> he's addressing it from the wrong orientation, but he's pointing out that actually Israel's uh, been funneling in a lot of aid into Gaza. And in fact, and he's publishing it. This is data that's coming from the UN itself. It's coming from UNRWA, it's coming from the OCHA. That in fact, the aid that went in this month was actually more than went in in the month prior to October. Now, if there wasn't a famine going on in the month prior to October, why is it going on now? Unless, you know, a huge amount of that aid is just being pinched by Hamas and being stuffed away in tunnels to stockpile it. But no one's making that claim either. Do, so, do I, do, sorry, Morgan, but do, do I sound like, you know, uh, self selfish in a good way to say, who cares about aid? Why do we care about aid? It you know, makes me think of why is aid the priority here instead of submission by the evildoers, submission by Hamas, submission by the Palestinians who support them. You know, it, it reminds me of uh, this quote from Miss Rand from the Playboy interview. You know, should we have compassion towards those who are innocent victims? And she says, I regard compassion as proper only towards those who are innocent victims, not towards those who are morally guilty. Now, are those Palestinians celebrating in the streets with uh, corpses of, you know, Israeli uh, concert goers? Are they innocent victims? You know, do they deserve compassion? And the, you know, the, the civilians who egg and support the leaders who committed the atrocities? You know, why, why is there aid at all until there's a complete submission by them to Israel. Yeah. And yes. by the way, that, oh yeah, Morgan, go ahead. Sorry, Morgan. Well, I mean, that no, 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 it's okay. No, it was good. Um, well, and just to point out, not just the lack of sympathy for the Israeli victims from the Palestinian side, but even just the callous lack of sympathy that's coming worldwide, the Associated Press, I saw just this morning, had awarded um, like a picture of the year award or something like that to a journalist who took a, a photo of the body of one of the victims, I think from the Nova Music Festival in the back of a truck. The, the photo is of her body dead, surrounded by a bunch of terrorists. And they thought that it was sensitive and right to award this guy, who I believe was a Palestinian, taking a photo of it. Now, actually, he might not be Palestinian. I'll take that back. But it's a it's an awful photo of a murder that's just taken place. It's not, you know, it's, there's a real lack of sensitivity here. Yeah. Now, a murder God, and, uh, you know, um, she was stripped not fully naked but close to fully naked which uh you know brings up that question and yeah whether or not he's palestinian i assume he is but he was you know he was there with them that day he knew you know he had advanced knowledge that this was happening that's why he was there to capture that photo so uh yeah it's, it's interesting what the associated percent press sees as uh valuable also you know mention this whole notion of innocence and war compassion uh, Dr. Gatte wrote an article that's still available online 20 some years ago about innocence in war. And I don't want to bore us too much about, you know, reading from it, but based very much, I don't think based, but certainly uh, echoed by John David Lewis's book, uh, Rosie, I know you have in your shelf as well, uh, 
He's nothing nervous. less than victory. Nothing less than victory. But, you know, Dr. Gatte says to be victorious in war, a free nation has to destroy enough of the aggressor to break his will to continue attacking. In modern warfare, this almost is always necessitate, necessitates collateral damage. So it's like every time, I mean, look, you've covered Razi and Morgan great, greatly how Israel's, you know, fought this war and maybe to some extent lost it even before they fought it. But, you know, isn't just the notion of sending aid in kind of admission of guilt? It's almost like saying, we know we're doing something wrong. We're so sorry. We apologize. I mean, why should there be any so-called compassion until there's a complete resignation of violence, submission, forget the return of the hostages, but just you know, an elimination of the threat writ large. Maybe then you talk about aid and compassion. Yeah, and, and that article is, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll try to put it in the chat if uh, we find it, but yeah, uh, it's, it, it shows the difference between the values that I think people should have and the values uh, that, that Israel has, which ironically are very close to the values of whoever wrote this article criticizing Israel, titled, uh, again, I'll go back to the title, it's Gaza Conflict, Snapshot of a Population Being Starved into Submission, as if their submission is a bad thing rather than the appropriate goal of this war. Uh, and and Is, you isn't, know, that the, right? isn't that the point of a war, to get the other side, to submit and quickly as possible? I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's so dark to imagine, you know, I, I hate to say this, but like, Dropping the bombs in World War II, I'm not going to say it's the best thing that happened to the Japanese people, but it allowed the Japanese people to have a complete reorienting of their philosophy, become not only a friend of the West, but a huge prosperous uh, power, you know, part of the West. And, you know, it's I'm not wishing that on Palestinians by any means, but Raza, to your point, submission is what is required. And, and you know, plainly put, they started it. Yeah. And uh, by the way, that paragraph, uh, we'll, we'll go to the rest of the article, but that first paragraph uh, ends with the country, has uh, Israel, has accused UNRWA staff of involvement in the October 7th uh, Hamas attack, but has provided no evidence this was the case and the agency denied the allegations. So uh, it's it's not just that we have evidence of UNRWA uh, uh, members participating in the attack, uh, others uh celebrating it um and and uh, but we have we know what UNRWA has been and by the way it it operates under a Hamas dictatorship or operated under a Hamas dictatorship you think they could do anything that isn't approved by Hamas at any point but anyway uh this article finds no evidence and um speaking of no evidence let's go to paragraph 2 so uh across the whole 141 square mile Palestinian enclave there are now high levels of critical food insecurity, but the situation is worse in uh, governorate uh, of, of uh, uh, Gaza, North Gaza and Gaza, uh, where the situation is assessed at the highest level under international standard IPC5, which represents catastrophe slash famine. Um, Too bad. Oh, well. Well, too bad if it were true, but, uh, you know, I, okay, so, I let, let, so so it continues, this is defined as an air as quote, an area uh, that has at least 20% of households facing an extreme lack of food, at least 30% of children suffering from acute malnutrition, and two people for every 10,000 dying each day due to outright starvation or to the interaction of malnutrition and disease. Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, remember when you have numbers coming out of Gaza about anything, about the size of the population, about the number of people died, the percentage uh, who are women and children and so on, the uh, numbers of people who are hungry, all of that comes from the people who committed the, the uh, you know, the mass uh, uh, torture, mass rape, and mass murder of Israelis on October 7th and have vowed to do it again and again until Israel is annihilated. Those are the people whose numbers uh, these organizations are relying on when they tell us that Israel is doing what really it should be doing. Jonathan. Yeah, I mean, it. it I don't trust them at all, not one bit. And in fact, if you follow any of the so-called, you know, sympathetic Palestinian uh, social media links. Some of them are such 
complete outright farces. I mean, they like show a like a scene from an old Western film and they say, see, here is Israel bombing innocent Palestinians. It's it's you know, but even the very notion of it, I, I feel terrible, uh, Razi, for Israeli young people because they're out there, you know, being productive, living their lives and whatever it is. Maybe they're not scientists and, you know, tech people, but, you know, they're pursuing their interests. And along comes um, you know, this requirement, and we can talk about whether it should be required or not, but, you know, this this existential threat. And the fact that the Israeli government takes, you know, the so-called innocence at, at war, you know, makes them a priority. This is, again, what Dr. Gatte said, if in waging war, government considers the deaths of civilians in terrorist states as a cost that must be weighed against the deaths of our own soldiers or civilians, our government therefore violates its most basic function. It becomes not an agent for our self-defense, but theirs. And that's what I think is so heartbreaking for these truly innocent Israeli young people, these soldiers, and not so young people, is you have the Israeli government, because of lack of moral support worldwide, is forced to plan ahead and ask permission and put their own soldiers at risk and prolong the war instead of finishing it and and uh, you know with the moral authority to make sure that it never happens again. Yeah, and, and it's a good point that you know the sympathy we hear in the world is just for the people who committed the atrocities and the people who uh, celebrated it. It's not for the hostages who are going through unimaginable hell at the hands of these savages. It's not for the soldiers who are risking their lives to protect these savages. It's not for the Israelis who, uh, you know, are, are not able to go back to their home because they live close enough to a border with these savages. Uh, so, yeah, everything here is upside down, unfortunately. I'm haunted by that image in that video from like that first, the first day of the attack where they, they dragged that young girl out of like the back of a Jeep by her hair and she's completely a, a wreck and all around her, her between her legs is all bloody. And she's being pulled like worse than a piece of luggage. And I'm just, that is the level of savagery that you're dealing with. And, you know, Israel should be sending them aid and apologizing. It's, um, that is blasphemous. And that's the travesty. Morgan. I'm sorry, Morgan, I'm stepping all over you today. <laughs> no, it's it's okay, um, and let's not forget that the quite. Let's put aside the question just whether the claims of famine are true or not, just for a second. Famines happen in war, and in fact, in a huge amount of warfare across history, siege tactics have been employed, which stops food getting into the besieged area. And before the term genocide, so, and and the context here for what I'm saying is that this narrative around famine is forming part of the argument leveled against Israel that it's committing genocide. Now, certainly before the term genocide was coined after the Second World War, there were things which would be accurately described retroactively as genocides, like the, um, uh, well, like the Armenian genocide, for example. But <clears throat> if people really want to pursue this claim, let's do it consistently. Why don't you accuse almost every just war that's persisted as having consisted of a genocide? Now, are you going to do that? I don't think you are. And why aren't you going to do that? Because this is the war that you're particularly interested in and where you're going to use ideas in perverse and underhanded ways in order to achieve your goals, whether they're honorable or true or not. So people should just be aware of the way in which these ideas are being used. I mean, war is so awful. It's so ugly. And only governments, I'm paraphrasing from Ms. Rand here, only governments can start a war. And it's why the choice of government and, and for us as citizens is so important because they're the ones that represent us. The, they have an, the monopoly over over force and how it's employed. You know, but this this notion that you know we need to have mercy. Dr. Peacock has a, a line from the philosophy of objectivism series. Let me see if I, I have it here that I thought was you know really uh, you know really appropriate. Mercy. What do you guys think of this one? Mercy means an unearned forgiveness. Is that true in this case? That feel like we have to have mercy for the Palestinian people, send them food, send them aid, make sure that they're well-fed. Is that an unearned forgiveness in this case, as Dr. Peikoff says? 
I mean, I definitely agree. It's it's unearned. They don't deserve forgiveness. They don't deserve mercy. They deserve the suffering that we're being falsely told that they are uh, going to. Yeah, we did an episode of the Reality Show Extra a few weeks ago with um, with Mark Pellegrino and John Was, where we were talking about the difference between mercy and forgiveness. Because forgiveness, I agree with Dr. Peacock, is something which you can earn. You can take actions to earn that. But mercy is something which you bestow on someone in the undeserved circumstance. So it's pulling punches. Now, if, it, if you're talking about a kid on a playground, I can understand people might be more sympathetic. But if we're talking about an existential situation like a war, mercy is, is evil all the way down. And the idea, so I've, I've seen people encouraging mercy in this situation, uh, certain journalists on Twitter. If you're doing that, when Israel is having to fight for justice, that's how you could see it, then you're actively encouraging their self-sacrifice to the worst people imaginable. And it's a disgusting thing to do. And Christianity's perversion of moral priorities is something that's deep in our culture. And just war theory is founded originally in Christian documents. It goes all the way back to St. Augustine, although he never used the term and never developed it. So this perversion of what's right and what's wrong, what's just and what's unjust, goes all the way back in our culture. And unfortunately, it's really taken root in the post-war period, and we're seeing it play out right now. All right, let's continue with the article. It gets better. If by better, you mean more bullshitty. Um, so the next, uh, yeah, it continues. The, the middle governorates of uh, Dir al-Balakh and uh, Khan Yunus and Rafa in the south are presently classed as being IPC4 or, quote, emergency. This means the areas have large food consumption gaps which are reflected in very high acute malnutrition and uh, excess mortality. Now, I, I just want to quickly say before we continue, because there's there's more of this, uh, but uh, just quickly, um, I, I think this was published uh, before this happened, so they have an excuse, but I, I guarantee you uh, uh, they wouldn't change any of that. Uh, but, you know, Israel, uh, was it 10 days ago or so, um, uh, killed some senior officials in the uh, Hamas emergency uh, committee in Rafah. And we've had reports, and those are reports from Palestinians, about how after that, because those people controlled the the aid, uh, after that, prices in the market dropped drastically in Rafah, and people are eating much better than they did before. So, um, you know, there's a, we'll, we'll get later to uh, uh, kind of what what these uh, these people are suggesting based on their uh, their reporting, but uh, yeah, it tells you it tells you something that if there actually is any uh, intentional starvation of Palestinians, it is being done by Hamas, and of course we know Hamas wants to do that. Hamas wants Palestinians to starve because then the world will report that Israel is starving Palestinians, will put pressure on Israel, and Israel will end up not doing what needs to be done, which is eliminate Hamas. I mean, what's the line, Ms. Rand's line, that there's two sides to every issue, one side is right, one side, the other's wrong, and the middle is always evil? Seems pretty apparent, you know, in this case. Is Israel, quote, perfect? No, but they were the victims of this unbelievably murderous, unprovoked attack and um, are feeling the consequences. I mean, the lesson of this is it's, it's too gruesome to do the F-A and F-O, but, you know, war is terrible. You shouldn't start a war. And that's exactly what Hamas did. And they haven't ended it yet. They haven't, you know, there's no promise of, you know, I mean, go back and look at the images of the end of World War II. You know, the Japanese emperor comes and he bows down in front of the American and he relinquishes. I mean, you need that type of a true reformation among certainly the Islamist world writ large, but the Palestinians in particular you know, otherwise, this simply happens again. And Razi, what you've been making all week, if there's any type of a ceasefire or state that's given or goody that's given, you are literally rewarding bad behaviors, like the understatement of the century, just savage behavior, encouraging it. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's the fact that there's might be food malnutrition in areas of Gaza right now or, or among the Palestinian people, it, it makes me think of the old... Polish phrase, not my monkey, not my circus. It is Hamas's fault. It is not Israel's, and it should not be their concern at all. Yeah, uh, um, 
couple of things. I, I know we like to keep trolls' comments to the uh, Sunday show because they belong behind a paywall. If the trolls want their uh, stuff read, they need to pay us. That's how capitalism works. Uh, but this, there was one who says, do you realize how extreme you sound? Yes, we are extreme. We are extremely always on the side of the good against evil. And uh, that's that's not going to... That's not going to change. Morgan, you mentioned. Um, I just have to yeah. jump in. I mean, I love the Barry Goldwater quote. And there's a history of Miss Rand with Barry Gold Goldwater that extremism in defense of liberty is no vice. And of course, extremism, the art of smearing is a great read by Miss Rand. If you want to learn why it's, as Razi said, it's a it's a accolade, which we actually take as a compliment in this context. Yeah, uh, extremism, the defense of liberty is no vice, moderation, the pursuit of justice is no virtue. It was, it's how it's a bridge. Just, uh, he he uh, said a bit longer, uh, a bit more than that. But anyway, uh, Morgan, you mentioned Elon Levy. I saw a tweet from him yesterday saying that the day before Israel had let more than double humanitarian aid uh, into Gaza as uh, uh, was given in October, uh, before October 7th. That is absolutely shameful, disgraceful. That's not something to be proud of. That is saying you are being, that is as clear a statement that they are being rewarded for uh, the slaughter on October 7th as one can make. Uh, you, you, you know, you get a certain amount of humanitarian aid, you murder more Jews, uh, you get more aid. That is that is basically what that means. Morgan, any thoughts before we uh, continue? No, yes, I completely agree. And on the Israeli side, coming from Elon Levy, it's produced by this moral inversion and confusion. But for the people who are putting all this weight down on Israel, so therefore what we see is that kind of defense coming out. The people who have been doing that now and the people who have been doing it during the previous iterations of the conflict so that Israel never sees it through, you're morally responsible for all of the further deaths that have happened since the previous iterations to today, and the ones which will happen if Netanyahu doesn't see it all the way. And you can pretend to be a bleeding heart in Guardian articles or in the comment section here, all you like, but when you're using moral weight in a way which will lead to further death, and which will lead to further death of Palestinians when the war breaks out again as well, you're responsible for it. You didn't, you're not there pulling triggers or plunging knives into people. But ideas and morality are also very much involved here, and you're culpable for it. So don't give me any of that rubbish. I'm spitballing a bit from John David Lewis's book, but isn't the whole point of a war, you have to show the enemy that it is fruitless, that they are not rewarded, that they have to completely give up and renounce not just the actions, but the ideology that brought them to the actions. And, you know, Morgan, to your point, I mean, those who say, oh, you're going to send them some food or as we can all get along. I mean, they're, they're just ensuring that there's going to be years and years more of deaths. on not just the, Is you know, Israelis, but Palestinians as well. More of the same. Yeah. Um, by the way, there is a picture uh, from years ago of Netanyahu in the Knesset, the Israeli parliament, holding a copy of uh, John David Lewis's nothing less than victory, which, uh, you know, if, if he, if he did read it rather than just hold it, uh, I don't I don't know what to say. He, there's there's no excuse. There's already no excuse for uh, Netanyahu and the way he's conducting himself. Uh, I want to continue because I don't know if we're going to get through the whole article, but you I want to read get a very generous super chat. Yeah, I wanted to read Christian's uh, super chat first. We got the, the pretty much the same or a very similar question a few days ago, but we'll answer it again. So, Christian, uh, thank you for the super chat. Christian says, if Sinwar would get caught. To get information from him, for example, about hostages, would it be justified to use interrogation methods like Russians seem to have done to the uh, Islamic State suspect? Uh, my answer is absolutely yes. Uh, I will go to you guys. Uh, Jonathan, what do you think? Well, you know, Dr. Peikoff has a wonderful response to that. And, you know, our our hope and our goal with these programs is in part to encourage you to read and learn from a true, you know, objectivists. So I'm not going to play it now. It's only uh, about a minute and a half. So uh, I'll just use this as a tease to go check out Dr. Peikoff's response. Uh, he talks in, you know, very detailed. And this is back kind of in the war of the, in the wake of the, the so-called war on terror 
from the uh, mid 2008. So I will defer and steer you to Dr. Peacock's just peak, uh, Google Peacock podcast torture and here, or we can also put it in the, the, the show notes as well. Morgan. I, <clears throat> I did, you know, I, res I understand the question in a way, but I don't like the framing just because anything that the Russians do is invalid. Any Russian soldier who points their gun and pulls the trigger is doing something they're not, they shouldn't morally do. Whereas the Israelis can do that, do, do the same thing with justification because of the context. So whether you're talking about torture, interrogation techniques, or anything that the Russian military is involved in, it's axiomatically ruled out. So I did just want to say that. Yeah, I, I agree with that completely. And now let's go back to the article. I'm going to read two paragraphs in a row now because uh, that way we might make it through the article. So the next segment is titled Developing Catastrophe. The Integrated Food Security Phase Classification, or IPC, was originally developed by the UN in 2004 for use in Somalia. It is administered and implemented by a global partnership of 15 organizations. It enables both governmental and non-governmental organizations to assess situations using a scientific measure, allowing decision makers to reach informed decisions quickly and accurately in situations of extreme urgency as in Gaza at the moment. So these are very kind people who are using a scientific method to help the uh, decision makers who are you know, struggling with uh, uh, how to make a decision. Jonathan, your thoughts on that? Uh, and uh, I, I don't know if the tone of my voice gave my thoughts on it, but uh, yeah. Go, go to Morgan because I'm interacting with Michael and Robin and so many of our YouTube uh, chatters who support us on a monthly basis. I know that it, important that is, and we've got such a great cadre of Kristen and Robin and, and uh, you know, Michael, they are part of our YouTube philosophy posse. So I'm hanging with them for a moment. I'll defer All to right. Morgan. Morgan, I'll go to you and then I'll continue reading. So I didn't get a chance to have an in-depth look at their methodology, though, as you say, they're framing it as scientific and the implication is accurate and reliable. When we've been looking at methodologies which have been used in the conflict so far coming from different organizations and the data which is coming out of it, we can see very clearly that it's not reliable and it's certainly not scientific. So when they're making this claim, it's a, it's a bold claim and it's an important one, whether it's true or false. Now, I'm dubious about whether this is true or false. And there's a lot of supplementary evidence that we're seeing floating around, which I can't make a firm final assessment on, but which makes me very suspicious that if these are the conclusions that they're coming to, then I'm very dubious of whether this methodology is actually scientific. Uh, so we have a, another super chat. Thank you, Romeo's Dagger. Uh, Romeo's Dagger says, Morgan, listen carefully. I'm Israel Chai, not Chai. That's me trolling Morgan for the last time we uh, got this. But yes, it is not a requirement of panelists to uh, speak Hebrew. Thank you. I can speak uh, Greek. Yeah. I can't speak Hebrew. Well, now you know uh, one thing in Hebrew. And uh, all right, let's let's continue uh, with the article. So yeah, they're uh, you know being uh, they're helping decision makers. So according to the most recent IPC rankings published on March 18th and based on data taken during the month uh, to March 15th, 677,000 people in Gaza were in IPC5, that is a, quote, catastrophic situation. Another 876,000 people were in IPC4 or an, quote, emergency. Uh, some 578,000 people were judged to be in IPC3 or, quote, crisis and 90,000 were in IPC2 or, quote, stressed. There were no people in Gaza judged to be, quote, food secure. Now, it's important when you look at numbers like this to, first of all, uh, you know, you, you don't actually, you, you can't take a, a sample of all these people, right? You are uh, assuming a lot of things. First of all, you're assuming, again, the population numbers given to us by Hamas. You're then assuming their situation from the Gaza Health Ministry, which is Hamas. And then you're telling us, based on what Hamas has said, uh, we'll get later to the conclusion of what the policy should be. This is gonna shock everybody, I'm sure. But uh, yeah, this is, we're given Hamas data and then it's uh, scientifically uh, put together 
to recommend policy. Jonathan. What's so frustrating is more and more this comes out, Razi and Morgan, is how much of elements of the West were compl- have been complicit with Hamas and UNRWA and everything that's going on in the UN is the best example of, you know, so many, you know, Western observers, et cetera, basically what I've observed, seen and read is, you know, facilitating and certainly being knowledgeable of a lot of the military actions that were going on and schools and hospitals and all the like. But, you know, whether or not there is food starvation in Gaza, whether people are struggling in Gaza, it's like, again, I, I don't want to speak for you guys, but I guess I sound like such a complete harmless SOB when I say, who cares? Not Israel's problem. Israel didn't do this. Israel didn't start this. Israel isn't responsible for this. It is 100% whatever troubles the people of uh, uh, the Palestinians are feeling. It is 100% the problem of their elected government. And that is Hamas. And that is who is to blame. It's not the West's fault, capitalism's fault, Israel's fault. Israel was the victim in this case. So whatever stats stats you might uh, cite about, they don't have medicine, they don't have food. I mean, it's terrible. And it's Hamas's fault. And if they want that situation to change, they need to get rid of Hamas and renounce all of the philosophy that brought them to this place. That's the only thing that can fix it. Morgan. One of the people who's quoted at the end of the article, I'm sorry to jump ahead just briefly, is Philippe Lazzarini, who for people who haven't been following some of our other UNRWA content is the Commissioner General, I think is his title of UNRWA. And this guy is a complete disgrace. And one of the things that's quoting him saying is that the tragedy... The tragedy which is unfolding on our watch is the is the famine which the article is talking about. Now, what a joke coming from him about the tragedy that's unfolding on his watch, UNRWA's watch. The, the tragedy which unfolded on UNRWA's watch was all of those little kids indoctrinated into praising martyrs, the data center underneath their headquarters, their employees who stole bodies of um, dead Israelis and who kept... T- um, hostages in their attic right so one of the things that i mean which we're doing here and which we've done elsewhere and which people should be doing all the time and should be particularly doing here is evaluating i guess you'd say the provenance of the source if, can i rely on this who is this coming from does it mean anything and coming from philippe lazzarini if he told me the sky was blue i'd go double check so d- don't listen to any of these evil people and, and I'll, I'll add to that, if I, I think you guys would probably agree, the United Nations writ large. I mean, when I talk about radical, Ms. Rand decades ago was talking about getting rid of the United Nations, withdrawing to the United Nations. This is an article from Ayn Rand Institute's New Ideal, just a little bit of an introduction that I encourage you to go read about why Ms. Rand thought that United Nation was truly was evil, enabled evil. And everything that's gone down with the United Nations involvement in this massacre in the Middle East, I think, again, demonstrates she was, I don't like that term prophetic, but she saw the consequences of the bad ideas that were fomented decades ago, and now they're playing out in real time. Yeah, and I think if we had like an IPC-like system for uh, the levels of despicability of people in the UN, Philip Lazzarini would probably be a five uh, if it's, you know, one to five. And so would um, what's Francesca Albanese, who we talked about a couple of times this week. And uh, one thing that she, I don't know if intentionally or accidentally let out uh, in her in her speech presenting her report a few days ago, was that this ongoing catastrophe is, has been going on for 76 years. It's the very existence of Israel that uh, the, the people in the UN who allow themselves to sometimes accidentally say what they really mean? Uh, this is this is what they're this is what they're talking about. Um, yeah, Jonathan, do you have something to add? Yeah, I mean, I'll just throw in. You know, I thought a lot about this, and uh, you know, just what is part of the altruism that drives the you know the requirement for uh, for aid and all like that? You know, is it um, you know is what is it? Is it like? just the idea that every culture is the same, even a culture that dedicates itself to the extermination of Jews, attacks on Jews. I mean, is it that sort of, you know, idea that we're all the same, you can't be too harsh, you can't judge too harshly. You know, I mean, it, it's like, why is there this philosophical requirement that you have such empathy and such compassion for exactly the people who are s- still actively working to try to kill you? What's behind that? 
Um, all right, I'm going to read a few paragraphs at once. Uh, but yeah, people, you can go read the whole article uh, on your own time, but uh, just to make sure we get through all of it. So it continues, but the situation is worsening by the day. By July, the projections are that 1,107,000 people will face an IPC5 catastrophe. Another 854,000 people are expected to face an IPC4 emergency, and 265,000 people will be in an IPC3 crisis. In addition to the, uh, actually, you know what, I want to make a point, just encourage people to go watch the beginning of uh, the reality show from two days ago, when we heard from, from uh, Francesca Albanese, uh, we, we played a bit of her video uh, in her press conference, and then I read out some headlines from articles saying that uh, Gaza will be uninhabitable, but uninhabitable by 2020. One of those articles was from 2019, another one was from 2015, another was from 2012. So this is not a new thing. Uh, nothing new is happening here, except that Israel is fighting back a little bit. Nothing new is happening in terms of us uh, hearing that, uh, you know, they're all about to die there. Um, but uh, the article continues. In addition to the lack of access to sufficient food, the quality of the available food is also a major concern. There is a significant worry about, quote, hidden hunger. This is when, even when people have access to, uh, have some access to food supplies, they are getting an insufficient quantity of essential nutrients. Uh, I think this is what we in the West call veganism. Uh, but it continues, the report uh, goes into detail about the urgency of the nutrition situation in northern Gaza, where in January 2024, uh, is, it was estimated that 98% of children consume two or, few, uh, or fewer uh, food groups, these being breast milk and eggs. The report found that in the children they examined, uh, legumes, vitamin A, rich fruits and vegetables, other vegetables, grains, meat and dairy products had, quote, almost completely disappeared from their diet. Uh, it's worth noting that 95% of uh, pregnant and breastfeeding women had themselves consumed two or fewer food groups uh, the previous day. Eating a well-balanced diet is crucial for pregnant and lactating women as it directly impacts their health, the healthy growth and development of unborn babies and infants, uh, postpartum recovery, and the quality of breast milk produced. While most critical in northern Gaza, these conditions are repeated across the whole of the strip, strip with varying uh, severity. Any thoughts on any of the above, guys? Uh, you know, again, it's, for me, it's the it's it's the numbers and the statistics that uh, you know you you have, kind of they're working with very little material, and that material comes from Hamas, and yet they are telling us that which is fact. While at the beginning of the article they told us there is no evidence for UNRWA involvement in October seven, which of course they they start off with a lie and they continue throughout. Uh, Jonathan, um, well. I'll, I'm going to go quickly, if I could, to a super chat, because we appreciate our super chatters. If I could, Razi, with your permission. Ideology says, gents, given your learning experience and instincts, how does this play out and how could it finally be resolved? It's an interesting perspective, especially instincts. I don't know if instincts has anything to do with it. Maybe some history and, and observation. I mean, you know, my two cents is, this has been, uh, you know, this type of Islamist unrest and, and violence towards Israel has been going on certainly since the state of Israel was organized and certainly since Ms. Rand started commenting on it in the 1970s and 1980s. And my off the cuff perspective is that until that real submission is in effect, until we see these country and in the, in leaders, you know, reverse the ways, reverse the, uh, the philosophy, reverse the education, I don't see how it can reverse other than Israel actually winning the war. I don't know, Morgan, what do you say? This is, you know, uh, your own uh, Brooke and Dr. Uh, Gatte called it the unwinnable war. How to win the unwinnable war. Can it be done? Well, what my stomach is telling me is that people should go watch the episode of the Daily Objective I did with Joseph Tabenkin yesterday or the day before about Japan, because I think that has a lot of leads there about how this could be finished and done with, because the Americans finished this exactly same kind of thing within seven years in Japan, not within decades. 
And <clears throat> I mean, in short, if you if uh, to give you a three word answer, it's going to be something like total victory. And this is forwards and submission, something like that. Well, the way I think it's playing out is the way I think it will continue to play out. Only worse, Israel doesn't have the moral clarity to do what needs to be done. It is uh, surrendering uh, more and more by the day. And unfortunately, the Palestinians will uh, take their lesson from this, which is the more you do what you did on October 7th, the more gains you will achieve until you finally achieve your goal of eliminating Israel. The reason we cover this every day and uh, uh, the reason we do what we do is to try to prevent that from happening. Uh, and, and of course, if you think this would help do that, uh, do share and like and uh, comment. That helps, which is why, of course, we also appreciate the trolls who comment and uh, help us with the algorithm and help uh, get our content to more people. We don't name trolls, uh, but we thank them collectively. Yeah, I mean, it's the whole premise of if there is a famine, which Razi, as you've demonstrated, there is not. But if there is a famine, a, would it be such a terrible thing? And B, who is to blame for the famine? Who is responsible for the famine? Who is responsible for anything that is uh, happening in uh, you know to the Palestinian people? It is 100% the fault of their elected officials who continue to make war, to hold hostages, to promise more to come. What should Israel do? Should they submit? Should they be the altruist? Should they turn the other cheek? And Morgan, it's kind of alluding a bit to that just war uh, pacifism that you know you alluded to. Is, is that Israel's responsibility just to sit there and accept endless missiles, hostages being taken? Uh, is that the moral thing that the world would expect them to do? I think that's very much what we're seeing. And I think that's the, the evil and destructive consequences of just war theory. I remember being taught it in school, in fact. And I remember the way the phrases, the key principles of just war theory, like proportionality, which we've spoken about a lot, sound so innocent and reasonable and inoffensive, don't they? Who would want to be disproportionate? Uh, it sounds as if it's, um, you know, a tautology because proportion. it sounds inherently irrational to be disproportionate. But the principles of just war theory are what are leading to the destruction of good people and a justified people, even if they aren't completely perfect. And... When you see that going on, people should think there's something rotten in the ideas which are motivating this consequence. Uh, I'll share it before I know we don't have too much time left, but I'll share just because Morgan has uh, mentioned just war theory. It, it kind of got a lot of attention maybe 15, 20 years ago. Morgan, you were taught it, and I learned a lot about it from Dr. Brook. So he has a, a lot of work that was published on that. This is Dr. Brooke and Alex Epstein going on, you know, almost 20 years ago. So look up a bit of what a lot of prominent objectivists have written a bit about that. And while at least for me, this very notion of worrying about, uh, you know, a famine, worrying about aid uh, to the people who are making war against you is as effing backward as it gets. Excuse my French. All right, let's continue uh, with the article. The next um, segment is titled Collapsing Healthcare. The results of this lack of nutritious foods is increasingly manifest in a rise in preventable health problems, particularly among children. Um, given the breakdown in services across most of Gaza, the report said it had been unable to obtain sufficient information about the health of the population to, quote, reach a minimum sample allowing exploitation of the information. Nonetheless, the World Health Organization has reported steep rise, uh, rises in acute uh, jaundice, acute respiratory infections, bloody diarrhea, diarrhea, meningitis, and skin diseases. So they don't have the information. Nonetheless, I, so anyway, uh, Daniel, I believe we have a uh, the animated video version of this report. Tom, I'm currently 10 miles outside of Beaverton, unable to get inside the town proper. We do not have any reports of fatalities yet, but we believe that the death toll may be in the hundreds of millions. Beaverton has only a population of about 8,000, Tom, so this would be quite devastating. Any word on how the survivors in the town are doing, Mitch? We're not sure what exactly is going on inside the town of Beaverton, uh, Tom, but we're reporting that there's looting, raping, and yes, even acts of cannibalism. My God, you've, you've actually seen people looting, raping, and eating each other. No, no, we haven't actually seen it, Tom. We're just reporting it. 
I think that is uh, the media coverage of this conflict in a nutshell. We haven't actually seen it. We're just reporting it. I mean, the fact that they would put it in the article this way. I, again, I'm going to reread this part. Given the breakdown in services across most of Gaza, the report said it had been unable to obtain sufficient information about the health of the population to, quote, reach a minimum sample allowing exploitation of the information. Nonetheless, the World Health Organization has reported, and then they go through the list. This is, uh, what more do you need? Apparently, you know, the people who are uh, on the pro-Palestinian side will uh, will will take it, uh, will take whatever they can get. Jonathan. Well, I mean, it's this idea of the Palestinians are suffering. Well, you know, are we supposed to weigh that against, oh, I don't know, the suffering of the hostages who were like literally at a music festival or hanging out at their homes? I mean, do we put their suffering on this list? Is it more or less? I mean, this whole notion of being sensitive in, in a time of war, I think it's so backward. I'm speaking a little bit out of my area of expertise, but, you know, the you know, whole notion of being, you know, again, sensitive and sending aid and, you know, this is war. War is terrible. It's horrible. I hope never to have to you know, be involved in one. But Israel didn't start it. Israel, you would hope, is trying to finish it. But in being so sensitive to and in, in, in sending in the aid and the, being, you know, articles like this only, I think, exacerbate it, prolong it and, uh, you know, make ultimately more dead Israelis and Palestinians as well. Morgan. Sometimes creative people can put the finger on the issue at the heart of things better than I ever could. And I think South Park <laughs> has done it a few times and does so there. <clears throat> Look, people, the reporting on the war should reek to you of people who are pushing an agenda. Now, we're looking at the problems here in this article, but if anyone is, you know, is going to come away from this thinking this is one bad apple, it isn't one bad apple. The whole bunch is rotten. And this is going on all the time and is said by very skillful communicators in a way that it might not immediately be obvious unless you're really reading critically and double checking. But you need to bring those skills to bear or develop them if you don't have them, critical thinking and evaluating sources. In everything you're looking at here, even from the Israeli side, you should be responsible people and double check and think and think twice. But this article is going to be read by people who are going to read it once, not question it deeply, and they're going to go parrot this stuff on Twitter. So uh, I'm going to read the rest in like 1.25 speed just so we get there on time. Uh, so, oh yeah, okay, nonetheless was where I... So attacks on hospitals and clinics such as the sieges of Alamar and uh, Nasser hospitals in the southern city of Khan Yunus and the attack on Al-Shifa earlier in the month will only exacerbate the situation. Just to, just quickly to pause here and say the attack on Al-Shifa was because Israel didn't actually get rid of that hospital, just got rid of some of the terrorists there, left, the terrorists came back, Israel came back and killed a bunch of terrorists who were there. Uh, so this is, uh, but this is not mentioned in the article. I guess the, you know, they're uh, they don't see it as essential. But when you put a military base at a hospital, it's no longer a hospital. It's you know, it is no longer a hospital. When you're housing military leaders and military equipment and weapons at a hospital, it is, it's now a military target. Yeah, and, and it tells you, it should tell you even more uh, how how important it is to attack such a target. That that is. That is the lesson to take from this, but uh, this is not the lesson this article takes. It doesn't even mention that fact. Uh, it continues, UNRWA's Commissioner General Philip Lazzarini called Israel's closure of aid deliveries into northern Gaza outrageous and said it was uh, an international plan to, quote, obstruct life-saving assistance during a man-made famine. And there is uh, this, this is also in a tweet by Lazzarini with a picture of a girl uh, with a frown on her face because... A picture to these people are an, is an argument. By the way, just quickly, we we did mention there was a, this BBC. Or I don't know if we mentioned, but there was this BBC uh, story about the, the the supposed famine. Had a picture of a, a very skinny, you know, child in, in a, clearly in a, a very bad situation, and they did mention this is not a child who was who was starving. This is a child who had some some disease, uh, but 
the picture fit the narrative. And it makes you wonder, like, if, if the, the numbers are what we're being told, uh, why can you not find one picture uh, of an actual starving child rather than, uh, than, you know, somebody who has a disease? Thoughts on that before we go to the last segment, Jonathan? No, let's uh, let's go to it. We're, we're running Morgan? out of time. No, let's, let's keep going. All right. Um, so the last part of the article, what can be done? The IPC's Famine Review Committee, FRC, says a ceasefire is the only way to alleviate this imminent famine. Provision of food and medical aid must be scaled up as a matter of urgency. Attacks on hospitals and sanitation facilities must be halted. And any humanitarian intervention must ensure that in addition to aid provision, commercial access to food and medicines must be restored as a matter of urgency. It's also vital that aid organizations be protected and allowed to collect up-to-date information about the state of the crisis so that resources can be directed to where they are needed most. But there's little sign of this happening at the moment. So this organization that just collects information scientifically to tell you what is happening on the ground is also an organization that I guess has the scientific uh, 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 fix to the problem, which is for uh, Hamas to continue to exist, Hamas to continue to control the Gaza Strip, the people who worked with Hamas previously to go uh, you know, unchallenged and continue their work, and uh, for Israel to accept October 7th happening again and again until it is annihilated. Jonathan. I mean, this is my, this is what we need. We need a surrender. This is the shot from September of 1945, the Japanese surrendering to the U.S. And we haven't seen that. And the more that came after, of course, dropping two atomic bombs on two Japanese cities. The more aid we send, the more we prolong the deaths on the Israeli side, on the Palestinian side. And uh, that's why the whole approach to the war has been wrong from the get-go. Morgan. When I came to this final few paragraphs in the article, I thought, well, here we see where this bears fruit. And this is the conclusion that, the, that these people want. And the people who are arguing about this on Twitter in various media publications are looking for. And as I said before, if that's the outcome they're able to achieve, then this will happen again and again and again and again and again. And you can't go around telling me that you're against death and murder and famine if that's what you're doing, because the famine, if it, you know, the famines will happen again. So don't do this. Yeah. And just as as the bottom line, I think the call for a ceasefire says it all. You cannot call for a ceasefire at the moment without being a supporter of the people who did October 7th and a supporter of it happening again. That is what being that is what a call for a ceasefire means. You want October 7th repeated again and again because a ceasefire allows those who guaranteed it happening again and again uh, to remain in power and to repeat uh, what they did. Jonathan, quickly, where can people find you? Well, the new book is written with Dr. Peakoff. It's called can you really love a dog? It's available on Amazon. And big thanks to all of our supporters on YouTube and the channel writ large. Morgan, where can people find you? You can find me at Morgan Carter 98 on Twitter, which will be in the description where there'll also be a link for my Substack, which is very recently going to be relaunched. The first piece is finished. I got some good feedback from Don Watkins about it, which he tore it to shreds, but I'm going to re reconstruct it. And you'll find that on there soon. I'm at Rosie Ginsburg on X. Uh, we'll be back with the Daily Objective tomorrow at 5.30. The reality show is back on Monday. Sunday, there's the members-only version. We will be reading some of the uh, wonderful trolling comments from today's show. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Like, share, comment, and subscribe. We'll see you tomorrow.